Tomb Raider has had many reboots and reimaginings over the years. Passing from one dev to the next like some sort of... Hold on. Never mind, you get the picture. I like the new games, they're great, but we're talking about the original, where it all began back in 1996. The titular Tomb Raider, also known as Lara Croft, is a badass British archaeologist with a knack for doing what we do best, going around the world, stealing ancient things from native cultures, and killing anyone or anything that gets in her way. Lara is truly an iconic gaming character. She's the Indiana Jones of gaming except with a pair of guns. The man accredited to creating this character was one Toby Guard. It's said that his goal in creating Lara was for a very real looking woman who would be in contrast with all the other female game characters to date. Okay Toby, nailed it. Anyway, back in 1996, full 3D graphics were in their infancy. And 96 itself was something of a hallmark year for games in general. Just to name a few, we got Duke Nukem 3D, Daggerfall, Crash Bandicoot, we got Resident Evil, we got Super Mario 64. So yeah, big year for games. And then along came Tomb Raider, developed by Core Design and published by Eidos. Eidos. Edos. This was one of the few releases that really changed the game for everyone. Third person action games were about to take off in a big way bringing the action from a whole new perspective. And arguably none of this would be possible without Lara Croft's first adventure. Well, let's take a look at how it plays today. So the Steam version of the game, as with many games at this time, comes with an already configured DOS box install. No need to mess around there, so that's good. Loading it up, we come across a few complications. One of the first I notice is the FMVs. If you're not familiar with old games, you might think this is just how the cutscenes are supposed to look, but no 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 no. Big black lines, we want rid of those. There are a few patches available online that fix this and a number of other bugs, including re-implementing the PS1 soundtrack that was missing from the PC version. But for the purpose of this video, the only patch I'll be using is the FMV fix. Now that the cutscenes don't make my eyeballs bleed, let's move on. So my second issue is not being able to move. The numpad keys work by default and rebinding them crashes the game. But besides, I'm a true modern man, I want to play with my DS4. DS4 Windows doesn't seem to work so we use joy 2 key instead. This helpful post had some profiles set up which worked with an Xbox controller. I just had to change the action key from left control to numpad enter, otherwise this happens as I bounce around. Ok so with all that out of the way we're finally ready to play the game. We'll first want to familiarise ourselves with how to do just that. In the Croft Manor we learn the basics of movement, climbing, swimming and such. We also learn at some point in the past Lara unearthed the fucking Ark of the Covenant and no one seems to mind her just keeping it in her house. Top. Men. So if you've played any third person platformer game in the last 25 years then well, forget everything you've learnt up to this point. Pay attention to the tutorial since Lara controls unlike any other character in a video game. By today's standard she controls like a tank balanced on shopping trolleys. This was before analog sticks were a thing, mind. The whole game is built on a grid. You can see it in how the levels are designed. Learning how to move around this grid effectively is key to success in this game. That's the gist of it. What's a man gotta do to get that kind of attention from you? It's hard to say exactly, but you seem to be doing fine. Well, great. Though truth is, it ain't me that wants you. Oh? No, Miss Jacqueline Natla does. From Natla Technologies. You know, creator of all things bright and beautiful. <laughs> 
Seal it, Larson. Ma'am. Feast your eyes on this, Lara. How does that make your wallet rumble? I'm sorry. I only play for sport. Then you'll like a big park. Peru. Vast mountain ranges to cover. Sheer walls of ice. Rocky crags. Savage winds. And there's this little trinket. An age-old artifact of mystical powers buried in the unfound tomb of Qualapec. That's my interest. You could leave tomorrow. Are you busy tomorrow? The opening FMV sets the scene. We're sent to Peru to unearth an artifact called the Atlantan Scion. We don't know much about this object, or our mysterious benefactor, Natla for that matter. So our mission right now is to head deeper into the cave and find out what we can. The first level is really easy, presumably acting as an advanced tutorial. There are a couple of wolves and bats scattered about to deal with. Use these to get to grips with how the combat works. My favourite strat is to backflip while shooting. It's all really simple stuff here. There's no difficulty levels after all, so the game does a real good job of easing us into the action. Soon we pull this lever and head to level 2. My advice is to save immediately and save often. There are no checkpoints or auto saves where we're going. The PS1 version had predetermined save points. The PC port, however, we get unlimited save states instead, wherever, whenever we want, so use them. The second level is again pretty simple, so I won't go into too much detail, but here we learn what most of the game is going to be about. Look for a key, item, switch or box to push, use them to advance to the next area. Do some climbing and platforming, avoid traps, always be wary of corners. Also watch out for this bear. We open up the path and proceed to level 3. This is possibly the most memorable level in the game, for reasons you'll see shortly. As soon as we start, head left. Here we find an incomplete series of cogs. This sets up our objective for the level. We can jump across for a shotgun here too. We then head back to the waterfall and deal with these wolves, make our way down the cliffside, and we're here in the Lost Valley. Now, if this was a Far Cry game, at this point, Laura would brush past some stinging nettles and have some kind of trip for 45 minutes. But since it isn't, and we don't, instead there are just living dinosaurs. Life, uh, finds a way. Laura isn't phased one bit by them though, it's just another endangered animal for her to mount on her wall. Pro strat, don't waste shotgun ammo on the T-Rex, just cheese it with pistols from the cave. We scour the valley for the cogs. You can also get on the roof of the temple via this route.
We as players are informed of this by the early 3D jank that gives away the secret on top. Head back with the cogs and fail this jumping segment a hundred times. Put the cogs in place, the water drains, and we duck behind the waterfall to finish the level. Finally we're in a tomb, let's get raiding. But first, watch out for this boulder. We get our first real taste of puzzle solving here. The puzzles in Tomb Raider are less about riddles like you'd see in Silent Hill or Resident Evil games, and more about exploration, trial and error. And the error part usually means death. We have three doors to open, and three rooms filled with death traps to explore. Once we find all the levers, we're ambushed by one more raptor. Clever girl. We dodge these darts on the steps and head up to the throne room. I didn't like the way this mummy was looking at me, so I killed it. We grab the scion, and in tropey tomb raiding fashion, the walls start crumbling. Outside, we're greeted by this cowboy Larson. He's just sort of there, shooting at you, with no real introduction. It's a bit jank, but it works for the most part. With human enemies, our best tactic is to get behind them and just unload with the shotty. Well, you have my total attention now. I'm not quite sure if I've got yours, though. Hello? I'll heal and hide you to a barn door yet. Of course. You and that driveling piece of the ski on. You want to keep it so bad? I'll harness it right up your... Wait. We're talking about the artifact here? Damn straight we are. Right up. Hold on. I I'm sorry. This piece, you say? Where's the rest? Miss Natler put Pierre Dupont on that trail. And where is that? Ha! <laughs> You ain't fast enough for him. So you think all this talking is just holding me up? I don't know where his little jackrabbit frog legs are running him to. You'll have to ask Miss Natlin. <coughs> Thank you. I will. Located now to St. Francis's folly, new temptations torment me. Rumor amongst my fellow brothers is that entombed beneath our monastery is the body of Tiogen, one of the three legendary rulers of the lost continent Atlantis, and that with him lies his piece of the Atlantean Skion, the pendant divided and shared between the three rulers, which curbs tremendous powers. Powers beyond the Creator himself. My toes sweat at such possibilities, lying so close to my mortal self. Each night, I beat myself rid of these fantasies, but it is indeed a test. Pierre, you little bug. So we learn that the next piece of the scion is located in Greece, underneath an old monastery called St. Francis's Foley. And some bloke named Pierre is here too. Well, let's get raiding again. We fight a couple of new enemies in the Greek levels, mainly lions and uh, gorillas. 
I'm sure neither of those are native to Greece, but okay. It doesn't take long for Pierre to show up either. Pierre is weird. He literally appears and disappears seemingly at will during the Greek levels. I'm sure he's superhuman, or like the Undertaker or some shit. We just shoot him until he dematerializes. Climb out of this room using the pillars, then slide down here. Watch out for the uh, crocodiles. Eventually we find ourselves in this tall room where things start to get a bit interesting. There's one big locked door needing four keys at the bottom. Each level has a door, with each door leading to a trial pertaining to a certain Greek mythological figure. We have Damocles with this falling sword trap, Neptune with a long underwater section, Atlas with this symbolic boulder being the weight of the world, and of course Thor with his fucking Tesla coil. I guess core design couldn't think of any other figures from Greek myth who had lightning powers. Grab the four keys from each of these rooms to unlock the exit. Pierre shows up again after getting two of the four keys, along with some lions. Unfortunately we can't feed Pierre to the lions since we're Lara Croft, not- So the next level carries on the tradition of not knowing shit about the ancient world. This is the Colosseum. No, not that Colosseum, this, this Colosseum. It's actually an amphitheatre, but historical inaccuracies aside, it's a pretty straightforward level. For starters, give these gorillas the old Cincinnati special before heading to the Underworks. This lever opens up the way to the main viewing platform. From here we have to go to each of the corners of the amphitheatre to do a small puzzle. Pierre rematerializes from the spectral realm a few more times in this level too. Grab the key and swim past this croc to escape. On the other side we find a statue to the mythological figure King Midas. 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 If you're familiar with the story, you'll know everything Midas touched turned to gold, much to his detriment. If not, you'll learn this way. We fight a bunch more gorillas, so get those dicks out. There's also this sundial underground. Strange. Anyway, the deal with this level is navigating around this large ass room. We have a series of levers and a series of doors. The genius buried somewhere inside us figures out that the symbols on the doors correspond to the position of the levers. We then have to undergo a series of platforming challenges in the rooms, collecting a bar of lead from each as we go. Now with three bars of lead, we open the fourth and final room, and... Is this maths? No. We don't want to do mathematics, so we head elsewhere to find our fortune. Instead of raiding tombs for a living, we can just live here and sell things to cashforgold.com. Maybe destroy a few economies for a laugh, I don't know. In second thoughts, that seems like too much hard work. So with the three bars of lead now turned to gold, we can proceed. This is the sewer level, because you know all games have to have them. Despite the shit smeared walls, this was the first level I thought looked kinda nice. I don't know what it is about the cistern, it just, it just looks nice, but anyway. Sewer level, you know the drill. Raise the water level, collect keys, flip switches, 
the whole level takes place in this one room, so you'll be very familiar with this place by the end. So it's a good job it looks pretty. Pierre shows up again twice throughout the system. Just send him back to the Citadel of Rix or wherever this teleporting fucker goes. Also, in this room with gorillas we can grab the magnums by doing this backflip. Then we get to try them out on some crocodiles. We scoop up the final keys in this area, and unlocking the doors takes us to this checkerboard arena. If we flip this switch, it just lets out lions, so push this block and escape down the hall. The next level we start underwater. Just pull this lever at the end to lower the water level and our chance of drowning. We climb out of this room, and the game decides it hasn't been tricky enough, so it starts throwing more traps at us again. After we flip this switch, the room fills with water and we head down this tunnel. Pulling this lever causes the current to rapidly drag us to the other end. No. where we are bitten by a sewer rat, potentially contracting the buboes. We climb out and Pierre shows up again, blast this fool and watch out for the traps. Next there's a room with a spike pit and a lion. Clack the lion and climb up into the monkey zone. Grab the golden key and use it in the next room to raise these platforms. Which we traverse with the elegance of a gazelle. On the other side, there's another locked door with pressure pads, over which we move this stone block. This opens all the doors around the world except the one we need, and instead, rooms full of rats and gorillas are unleashed. Let's not forget boulders. We grab the keys and escape the room. We slide out this cat's mouth and then find ourselves in a vast cave. We dodge one hungry boy and venture deeper into the cave. After jumping across a ravine, we discover this temple with centaur statues, but there's no way in. A lever we pulled earlier in the map showed a tiled waterway, so we go looking for that. We find it and another lever here which opens the temple. After backtracking there, we head inside and... I must be going mad, I'm just going to ignore whatever the fuck that was. We head inside and Pierre is waiting for us. Grab the Scion, keys and magnums off Pierre before heading for the exit. Here lies Tohokan, one of the two just rulers of Atlantis, who even after the curse of the continent had tried to keep rule here in these barren other lands. He died without child and his knowledge has no heritage. Look over us kindly, Tohokan.
The next few levels all take place in Egypt, and they're actually quite well realised. The whole aesthetic works really well here, and there's no glaring errors that stand out, like Thor in Greece or anything like that. Just good, simple, wholesome tomb raiding. Anyway, at the start of this area we're attacked by a mummy smashed off its bean on PCP. These new enemies can be a pain to deal with, but seeing how most enemies so far have been too easy, it's not a major complaint. Just be wary of the camera when fighting in corners. Our task here is to get four glyph stones for this obelisk to open the way forward. So we head into the Sphinx. We get a nice mixture of everything thrown at us in this level, with more emphasis on pushing block puzzles than previously. In fact, so much block pushing, I made this house out of them where, for a week, I decided to hide from the prospect of ever finishing this game. I've just got to say though, playing through this without a guide was a joy. I'd constantly be having these eureka moments as I figured out which switch did what to progress. That feeling you cannot buy with money. If the first group of missions in Peru were pure nostalgia, and all I could think about in Greece were the inaccuracies, then this is where the game really starts becoming its own. Deeper in the Sphinx we work our way around these different rooms, solving the platform puzzles and fighting more mummies as we go. Eventually we lower all the bridges and grab all four glyphs before heading back outside. Pushing all the glyphs into place opens the next area. On the other side we're instantly attacked by these guys. I'm actually relieved to find out the skinned centaur statue with the Mega Man blaster that attacked me a few levels back was not a hallucination and is in fact corporeal. These mutants behave a lot like mummies from the last level, but are easier since they will stop to shoot shit at you. So, there's this large sphinx in this cavern. We need two anks to open it. And to get those two anks, we need to flip two switches. And to flip those two switches we need to die, over and over, as we scale the side of this huge fucking cave. We eventually reach the first one, and another new mutant reveals itself. This one has wings, but it still dies to bullets. On the way to the second switch, there's this item hanging in thin air. Well, after a leap of faith, we can actually reach it and find it's a pair of Uzis. And, uh, just don't think about it too hard. With the second switch flipped, we can get inside the new rooms that have opened up. The first one just has a block puzzle and another centaur, but the second one has some more involved platforming. We grab the anks from each and plug them in at the top of the giant sphinx. The door at its feet opens up and for the first time in 20 odd years this game actually takes my breath away. In here there's some more of the same old same old platforming and lever pulling. But what's strange is this health kit in the statue's ear. Anyway, we head into the feet of the other statue and eventually find ourselves back in the starting room, but this time there's more muties here. Don't ever stop shooting them. Shortly after that, we arrive in the Sanctuary of the Scion. I still got a pain in my brain from you. And it's telling me funny ideas now, like to shoot you to hell. Will Larson shows up once again. Just give him a taste of Buckshot and grab the Siam. You just 
pulled the tough end of a wishbone. Howdy. Afternoon. Left Larson sucking wind then, eh? If that is the phrase. Well, your little vacation riot's over now. Time to give back what you've hijacked off me. Let's try the lunchbox. Well, kill her! Hey! You morons! Let's go. back inside. You coming? Steady. Here she goes. We ready yet? We emerge in this big cave, with none of our weapons thanks to Natla's goons. After trekking around for a bit, we find this crane holding a building in the air, as well as this fuse box. This map has a lot of backtracking in it, which is unfortunate since it's also the ugliest map in the game. Pulling a series of levers opens up the way further. Be careful getting this fuse, as running too far ahead will trigger the boss fight and he'll push your shit in. After collecting all the fuses, we retrieve our pistols and head back to the cowboy fight. The game gives us plenty of health kits, so dealing with them should be easy at this point. Like all human enemies, he goes down only after about 500 bullets have perforated his being. We retrieve our magnums from his body and then we drop down doing some more platforming over lava. This is where the scum begins. Prepare to die in almost every room at this point of the game, so save often. <laughs> 
We blow open a passage using TNT, which takes us to a level from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, where the next boss shows up. A guy the wiki literally just calls Skater Boy. Who spouts off taxi driver lines for some reason. Blast this fool and get your Uzis back. After a bit more platforming and another push block puzzle, we reached the entrance to the Great Pyramid. Say cheese! Immediately upon getting here, we're attacked by the last of Natla's goons. The aptly named Bold Guy is just as easy to deal with. Just run behind him while unloading the Uzis. Climb the side to get to this lever, which opens this door, which has the key to the Great Pyramid. Inside, we're greeted to a picturesque scene of machinery and carrion entwined, as we find ourselves in some kind of Atlantean birthing chamber. This is where the game starts pulling all the punches, and I'd be a complete liar if I said I didn't have an absolute blast playing through this level. First of all, nearly every room has at least one of those Atlantean mutants, so it's the most combat heavy level in the game. My gripes about fighting these guys are almost nullified, because the game gives us nearly limitless ammo in the following rooms. Second of all, we get some truly unique and interesting locations, which when juxtaposed with the Greek and Egyptian tombs of the early game, breathe some fresh air into the level design. On the other hand, the difficulty ramps up a lot here, so if you're like me, you'll be safe scumming after almost every jump. I really feel like some of Tomb Raider's best moments are all contained in this level, from some of the controller gripping jumps to just the whole aesthetic of the area. It really took me by surprise considering I hadn't played it in years. We work our way up the structure and eventually come to this room. After clearing out the mutants, we slide down into a pit, and I suddenly feel like I'm Natalie Portman in the end of Annihilation. This doppelganger appears, and it seems to copy all of Lara's movements. This was more than a little unsettling. Where did this thing come from? Has the pyramid been collecting Lara's DNA and spawning copies? Shooting it causes damage to Lara like it's a voodoo doll, so we have to use our head to beat this opponent. Pulling this lever on the other side of the room opens up a trap door which isn't present on the mirrored side, so we trick Bacon Lara into falling into this trap. It's clearly still alive down there, so I don't know how to feel about this. Moving swiftly on, we fight a few more Atlantans and head to the Scion. Lara grabs it and is treated to another vision of the past. You can't do this. We condemn you, Natla of Atlantis, for your crimes for the flagrant misuse of your powers, and for robbing us of our... You can't, I... Breaking the free bond of consent that our people are ruled and secured under, and invading Teopan and myself with our army, our warriors, empty from our pyramid. 
so that you can use the pyramid, its powers of creation, for your own mindless destruction. Mindless? Look at you. Neither of you have one squirt of inventive juice in your heads. Wasters. Let's just do it. Tihokan! You use the sacramental place as a source of individual pleasure, as some freak factory. They're survivalists, a new generation. A slaughter heap now. And you, we're gonna lock you in limbo. Make your veins, heart, feet, and that diseased brain stick solid with frozen blood. Greet your eternal unrest, Natla! You won't rest either, or your damned continent dance. Back again. And you? For a grand reopening, I assume. Evolution's in a rut, natural selection at an all-time low. Shipping out fresh meat will incite territorial rages again. Will strengthen and advance us. Even create new breeds. Kind of evolution on steroids, then? A kick in the pants. Those runts Qualapec and Tihokan had no idea. The cataclysm of Atlantis struck a race of languoring wimps plummeted them to the very basics of survival again. It shouldn't happen like that. Or like this. Hatching commences in 15 seconds. Too late for abortions now. Not without the heart of the operation. No! This thing is born from the giant egg in the ceiling, and it's apparently part of Natla's master plan, which is kept really vague, but from what I can gather has something to do with genetic engineering. Fighting it can be tricky, just give it as much space as it needs. Sometimes it'll seemingly hurt you without actually touching you, just be wary of it. Shoot it for approximately 5 minutes and eventually it'll fall. Still no explanation as to why mutants explode. Okay. We work our way back up to the Scion and destroy it. Now the whole place is coming down. Or so it seems. There's a whole lot of screen shake, but we have unlimited time to escape, so no need to rush. Save scum like fuck here because we will die and redoing these jumps can be a real pain. If you save during this fire segment, it seemingly turns off the fire, making the jumps easier. But you didn't hear that from me. We fall off this ledge but luckily land in water at the bottom. On the other side we're in a huge open arena. And we have to fight Natla one last time. She has two stages, blast her out of the sky, and then wait for her to resurrect, then blast her again. I used the shotgun on the second stage, but it was less than effective, just use the Uzis. After killing her for good this time, we scale the room and escape.
the game just sort of ends there. That was Tomb Raider 1. And as the credits show, only about six people worked on this game. Which is really impressive. <laughs>